Hello everybody, my name is Michael Mahasamy and this is my final project for CS5310 Computer Graphics at Northeastern Summer 2019 with Michael Shaw. Uh, for my project I've made tessellated grass. Um, for those that don't know what tessellation is, tessellation is basically taking a single primitive and turning into many other primitives based off of that input primitive. Um, so what that means in terms of tessellated grass is that we start with a base amount of grass for a single primitive and based on the tessellation level we can create more dense grass from that. Um, so rather than continue to explain it without showing it, it's a little bit easier to show what I've created. So we'll start by uh, building the project, um, which is the same way we've been doing it for the rest of the semester, just Python build pi. Um, I'm running on Mac, should compile just fine on anything. Uh, and then we start it, however your computer starts executables. Um, as you can see, no grass on the screen just yet. Um, that's because I wanted to really start out by highlighting that this is created from a very, very simple primitive. Um, so right now we have a square, just two triangles. Um, we'll flip it into wireframe mode by just pushing the W key. Uh, so you'll see it's just two triangles, uh, four, four points there, um, and two sets of indices just making up those primitives. Um, so obviously still no grass, but just to show what tessellation looks like, um, we can increase the tessellation level. Right now we're at a tessellation level of one, which is essentially no tessellation. Uh, but by hitting the up and down arrow keys, I've configured it so that you can increase that level. Um, so as you can see, as I hit the arrow key up, we get more and more triangles inside of those original triangles. Um, and we can increase this all the way up to whatever the maximum is for your particular system. Um, so I've set it up to just hit that upper bound. I think on Mac, for my computer it's 128, on my work PC it's 64, so you can't get as dense. Um, but as you can see you get a lot more triangles and they're pretty uniformly spaced out. Um, part of that is because I've selected to transform the inner and outer tessellation levels by three each time, which is a pretty uniform way of doing it. Um, so now, as we can see, we start out with this, this base square. Um, and if I hit the one key, that's what is going to create our grass originally. So now we see at each of those um, at each of those points, we have a single piece of grass, and it's blowing into the wind. We'll get to that. That was another technical challenge, a little bit of fun to add to the project. Um, but if we keep flipping between, we'll see the bottom of those blades of grass is right at the points of that square. Um, so now, as I increase the tessellation level to two, we see we get more blades of grass, and we can keep going all the way up to that maximum. We see we still get all that nice blowing grass, very dense area, and we're still in wireframe mode, so if we switch out, you can see that it looks very nice. There's no shading here other than the gradient, uh, but because of the dark and light contrast between the back blades of grass, where you're seeing the lower parts, and the front blades of grass, where you see that lighter green at the top, you can see a pretty good definition of each piece of grass and where it actually is located. Um, so I thought this gave a really cool effect, and obviously, depending on you know, if you wanted to do this in some sort of game situation, uh, you would probably limit how dense you can actually make it and make it configurable based on some user settings. Um, so as we see that go in action there, we'll flip back into um, the wireframe mode for the tessellation. We can see that, yes, all those blades of grass are, in fact, coming out of those different points there. So, into a little bit more of the technical side behind this. Um, there were two new shaders that we really had to create to make this possible, um, namely the tessellation evaluation shader and the geometry shader. Um, so we hadn't worked with these before and that made it particularly difficult to learn initially, uh, but when you really look at it, the tessellation shader is quite simple. Um, essentially, we are sending in information as triangles um, we're telling it that we have uh, we want to use an equal spacing algorithm. Um, it's a clockwise rotation on all the faces, and because of how we're creating the grass, we want a single point output. Uh, we put it into point mode, uh, and that prints out all of these triangles as just singular points and makes it waterproof. So if a point is duplicated, it won't actually create a new primitive point off of that. Um, we have this interpolation function that we use for both our normals and our position data. Um, what that does is takes the input from the triangle, so we have a 1, 2, and 3 on the uh, input there, and we get that from the GLN um, variable that is created for GLSL. Uh, we take the position, pass it in for each, 
And then these GL tessellation chords is another uh, built-in variable. Um, the X, the Y, and the Z all correlate to a point in the triangle and how much of that particular point is influencing the tessellation. So this point right here would be multiplied by each one there and then you get your final um, set, your final point there based on the input from all the other points percentages. So once we get that and we pass it into point mode it gets read in by the geometry shader. Um, so what this does, this is the real powerhouse behind the entire project. Um, so we have our new grass set up just as a simple triangle. Uh, we kind of transform it as we, as we run the program just to scale it and make it look like actual grass a little bit. Um, one of the most important parts of this is actually the normal data coming in from all of these different points now. Um, it gets used a lot because we want to make sure that the grass is always pointing off of the surface. Um, so in the case of the square that's just pointing straight upward, it's pretty straightforward. The grass just points straight up. But if we want to transform that to, say, some other object, um, we're going to want to transform it into that normal tangent space. Uh, the only thing is we don't really have tangents in this. Uh, we don't have any sort of texture that we need to worry about for the... Uh, for the grass to be facing a particular direction. So we really just need to make sure that the normal is in the same direction as the grass's Y. So to do that, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We still take the transpose inverse of the normal, of the model matrix for the normal matrix, like we do for uh, the tangent space that we did for a couple of assignments. Um, but now the only difference is we really just have to rotate that, uh, that up direction to match the normal by taking the angle that forms between them and rotating around their cross product. So pretty straightforward, we don't need to normalize anything and for that we get grass always pointing straight off of the surface. Um, the other technical challenge that came into this was adding another kind of interactive piece and that came in the form of wind. Um, so because we already took all that normal information, wind was actually pretty straightforward to implement. Um, we pass in a couple uniforms to a sine function for the amplitude, frequency, um, the phase is based on the time, so the sine wave keeps moving as time goes on, so that phase will increase with time. Um, and then we multiply it by some arbitrary kind of angle here, I chose 15 degrees. And then the last thing that we do is because we're blowing wind at a piece of grass, if that wind is already in parallel to the um, direction, then we don't really see that blade of grass moving too much. But if it's perpendicular opposing the wind, we'll see a lot more movement. So to do that, we can again use the dot product of the normal component with the wind direction this time, subtract that uh, absolute value from one, uh, since if it was parallel, it would be um, the most, the, sorry, the least amount of change um, in either the negative or positive direction. Uh, but if it's zero, we want to see a lot of movement. Um, and we rotate around the cross product formed by the wind direction and the normal. Um, so that's how we really get that nice wind effect right here. And you'll see when I uh, change this here, based on the fact that we've changed everything into normal space, we can put this on any object, which means we can do really cool stuff like put it on our bunny. <laughs> So this was a fun way to just show that we did all the work to turn it into normal space. We have information about normals on objects. We might as well use them. Uh, so you'll see if you look at the tip of the tail, the grass isn't moving too much. But if you look right at the front of that leg or on the nose of the bunny, you'll see a lot more motion. Um, so I just thought it was really interesting that because we did all those transformations ahead of time, um, just by plugging in different vertex and normal data, we're able to do something like this where it looks really believable is something like fur or in this case a chia pet. <laughs> um, so those were the two biggest technical challenges uh, making the wind direction kind of vary based or ver sorry the wind amount vary based on the position um, and transforming this information to normal space on top of just learning the new uh, tessellation shaders and geometry shaders in OpenGL 4.1 and up. Um, so 
I want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen to my video. I hope you learned something and I hope it was enjoyable and uh, hopefully some of you go on and make some Chia Pets based on this. So thank you.